Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Paul Bemis. I'm the president of Applied Math Modeling. And what we're going to do today is take you through uh, two different designs that we have uh, here for you today. It's going to be quite busy and we're going to be moving rather quickly. I have looked over the list. I see there's quite a few people online already, including a number of my uh, current CoolSim users. So I'm going to take you through a couple different designs. I'm going to be showing you some CoolSim features along the way just to show you how to model these things and what to look out for. And uh, to do that, I'm going to have a couple panelists join me. I have uh, two panelists with me today that will be joining. Um, first, let me introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. I am the president of Applied Math Modeling. I have a background in both mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. Uh, undergraduate mechanical, graduate work in electrical, and later on uh, business, worked for Hewlett Packard for many years, business uh, development, and then also worked for the ANSYS Corporation and the Fluent Corporation. CoolSim and Applied Math Modeling are a spin-off of the ANSYS Corporation. We're a value-added partner, and we use their technology to create application-specific tools CoolSim being the fundamental tool that we have today and uh, that we promote for modeling airflow in a data center. I also have with me today Keith Dunavant. Keith is a manager of data center cooling solutions at Munters, and we're pleased to have him with us. Uh, Keith is a professional engineer, member of the ASHRAE committee, has been involved um, with them for quite some time, has a couple of patents, I think four U.S. patents pertaining to data center cooling, and is an authority in uh, cooling systems using evaporative cooling technologies. He's been with the company for over 10 years. Chris Fulton will also be joining us today. Chris is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Air Enterprises, and they are a supplier of the Kyoto cooling system, which we'll be reviewing here today as well. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the way we do these uh, panels is uh, both Keith and Chris are off-site. I'm bringing them in through the GoToWebinar session. If you have questions for us, please use the chat box to ask questions, and we'll try to take them as we go, and we'll certainly take your questions at the end. I have tried opening microphones before, and it doesn't always work well, so please be patient and type them out for us and put them into the system, the little GoToMeeting window where it says chat or questions, and you can ask a question, and we'll try to answer them as we go, and I'll field the questions and, and serve them up to uh, Keith or Chris appropriately. With respect to a certificate, there are professional development certificates that will be available at the end of the webinar. If you'd like one, just uh, send me an email and uh, we'll get one out to you. Um, we are talking about data center design here, so it is completely appropriate. Now, as I mentioned today, we're going to be reviewing a couple of different designs. To get started, however, I'd like to talk about uh, a few issues up front, some acronyms, PUE, COP, some design optimization goals, and then we'll get into the two designs directly and talk about optimization for them. First, let me just review power utilization effectiveness here for those who aren't or may not be familiar with it. I think most people are. Product utiliz or power utilization effectiveness is a ratio. It's total facility energy over IT energy. Um, so total facility energy includes everything, chillers, pumps, condensers, fans, humidifiers. And you're looking at that in the numerator together with IT equipment. Uh, that's in the numerator divided by IT energy. So it's really how effectively is the facility uh, cooling the equipment. Now, of all the stuff in the data center besides the IT equipment, the dominant characteristic for cooling is the chillers and the coolers themselves. That includes the fans. UPSs, PDUs, switchgear, really second order. They're not a primary contributor to power consumption. And historically, it is not unusual for us to see a ratio of one to one. That is, for every kilowatt you put into the data center, it takes another kilowatt or, or horsepower, roughly, to get that power back out, that heat back out. That's a poor ratio. You want it to be much better than that. Uh, you want it to be at least a ratio of 4 to 1, where it's about 2.25 kilowatts for every uh, kilowatt of IT load. And that's what we'll be talking about today. 
that the PUE is really dominated by the power to drive the cooling system. Now if we take a look at that and we assume that that's the case, then the numerator uh, simplifies a little bit to be cooling energy plus IT energy divided by IT energy. In other words, if the cooling energy were zero here on the left-hand side, our PUE would be one. Now a good PUE is 0.2. So that means that you've got your IT energy here being the same. And over here you've got a 0.2 and that is your power to, to drive the cooling system. So focusing on cooling energy provides the biggest payback. And a cooling energy, for those of you who may not remember, is really about the coefficient of performance of the cooling system itself. Coefficient of performance is uh, the mechanical shaft power required to pump the heat out of the room. So it's simply a ratio of the total thermal load in the room, including the fans, by the way, which are heaters at the end of the day, uh, divided by the energy required uh, to cool the data center. In other, in other words, the work. Heat rejection in the numerator, work in the denominator. So if that's COP and we then go back to the equation, we can substitute cooling energy for the ratio of IT over COP, and we end up with a simplification that is 1 over the COP plus 1 equals PUE. And it's a nice way to think about it. If you keep that relationship in your mind when you're working on data centers or talking about data centers, you can quickly figure out pretty much where you stand. In other words, if the COP is 4, then the ratio is going to be 1 over 4, which is 0.25 plus 1, 1 1.25. That's a pretty good PUE. 1.2 is just considered to be excellent. So 1.25 isn't bad. And the COP of a standard chiller historically is right in that range of about 4. Now the units we're going to be talking about today can get much higher than 4. In fact, if you use no energy at all, then uh, as COP goes to 0 uh, or 1, then um, you would get a much better uh, relationship. I'm sorry, it goes to 0. As it goes to 0, the PUE would go to 1. Okay, so you want to drive the COP as high as you possibly can. Now, just to review again the Rankine cycle, this is why this is the case, and this uh, also gets to the point of today's discussion as well, is, is the shaft power required here to drive the cooling system. We need to compress a medium, which is a gas. Ideal gas law means that's going to get hot. The hot air then enters the condenser, and there's usually a fan blowing on the condenser that dumps it into the environment. This is outside. This is the outdoor air temperature right here. We then come out of the condenser through an expansion valve into an evaporator, which is another heat exchanger, which is uh, dumping cold air. As you, as you blow across this, you get cold air. The, uh, the medium heats back up, becomes saturated, goes back into the compressor, and gets compressed. And this is the cycle over here, a typical ranking cycle. And the issue is work in, trying to get the shaft power to zero if you can, which drives the COP up. So compressors have shaft power. That's where their energy is going to. In general, the higher the return temperature out of the room, the less energy required. And that's simply because you need less lift. Lift is the pressure delta in the compressor itself. You have to compress hard um, to get high temperature. And uh, if the return temperature is already fairly high and the outside ambient temperature stays you know, relatively modest, it's easier to dump the heat. You have a greater delta T on the exhaust side, the dump side, to the atmosphere. One other point I want to make here is fan power. Uh, fan power is a cubic relationship, if you remember. And uh, here, we have that the new power is equal to the old power times the ratio of the RPM. Assuming here the fans are within their pressure delta of normal operation and not operating uh, beyond the knee of the curve. So you have the ratio of uh, new RPM to old RPM cubed. In other words, the power for a fan to drive it drops off as a cube when you reduce the RPM. Now, you don't always get cubic, but you certainly get second order or higher. 
So the two big issues in, in data centers are going to be the compressor and the fans. And lowering fan speeds uh, reduces power quite considerably. The other governing equation here that I want to review is the one that pertains to all equipment in the room. And this, uh, this one came up, Keith, when we were uh, talking in uh, the, the rehearsal we did earlier for the event, is that the heat being uh, dumped or used, either case, is equal to the mass flow rate times the uh, density of air times specific gravity times um, specific heat of air times delta T. Now here I've got the delta T of the supply versus return of the room. But this equation is general. It also pertains to the racks, and it also pertains to the out outdoor air temperatures. So uh, to dump a given amount of heat here in the room, uh, there use two variables. By the way, uh, density and specific heat are going to remain relatively constant. Density does change a little bit with temperature, but within range, it's about the same. So there's two ways to dump the heat. You can have a, a delta T here that is significant. Now, on very cold days, if you're using air-to-air -air heat exchangers, like we're going to be using in this examples today, you can get very cold air outside. And you can bring that cold air in and keep your fans down low. But if you don't have that, then you've got to run the fans up to take what temperature you do have and try to uh, dump that heat. Because the heat coming out of the back of that equipment is going to be, you know, you're typically going to see a delta T of about 20 uh, or more going across that equipment. So two variables you have, uh, flow rate and also uh, the temperature of the outdoor environment. Okay, something to keep in mind as we roll forward. So we're going to take a look at two designs here today. And uh, Keith, I've, I've um, brought you in on this. And you can unmute. I think your mic is muted at this point. So you can unmute your mic yourself there and take us through this first one. Um, I used the slides that you provided for this Munter's Indirect Evaporative Cooling Unit. And then when we shift back over to a cool sim, I'll, I'll pick it back up. So if you'd like to uh, take us through these diagrams here, you certainly can do that. and. What you're seeing here is a generic indirect airside economizer. We've got hot return from a plenum coming into the unit into a fan, and that is going to then push that air into the air-to-air -air heat exchanger, extract heat from it, uh, have the option of filtering the air and extracting additional heat through a coil. So, Paul, if you want to go ahead and advance the arrows, since I'm not able to do that, yeah, I got it so for you. The, uh, exactly the airflow path. So what, what you've got with an indirect economizer is the benefits of an outside air economizer without the downside of introducing pollutants and uh, moisture that will impact the humidity of the data hall environment. So it's, um, it's a good way to go, especially in more humid climates or uh, areas that have high ambient pollution. And it can be a very efficient option, uh, especially when incorporating uh, evaporative assist in that scavenger air prior to the heat exchanger. So you want Right here, right? Exactly, exactly. So you're using outdoor air. You also have an evaporative component here that will work under certain uh, wet bulb conditions. And then you have air-to-air uh, -air heat exchanger right here. So you're not bringing direct air into the, into the environment. You're looping it through a heat exchanger with some assist. And then here on the hardware side or the IT side, you're looping through the same, same thing with a DX unit in those cases that you need it, right? Right. And if you do have a DX system, uh, you have the option of putting the condenser coil to re reject that heat of compression uh, in the scavenger exhaust, yeah. leaving the system. Yeah, over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, this is another uh, representation you showed me here. Right. And so we offered various types of air-to-air -air heat exchangers with our indirect economizing solutions. This is uh, one that is very efficient. It's a polymer tube heat exchanger. Uh, it's constructed of, of polymer tubes that are typically eight feet in length. 
and there's literally thousands of them uh, inside of a heat exchanger system within a, uh, a large air handler that would be used to cool a data center. And so this system can operate dry in the wintertime uh, as a cross-flow type of a heat exchanger. That gives you about a 55% effectiveness. Uh, and then in, uh, as it warms up, you can fill the sump with water and begin to circulate water to wet the exterior of the tubes to get a, uh, a very close approach to ambient wet bulb temperature to continue to, to give you uh, the ability to continue to cool even when it's very hot. So if you'll go ahead and start uh, uh, the next uh, animation, uh, you can see here on a 95 degree day, and, and uh, if you'll toggle it one more, um, we can cool uh, from 95 to 75 as long as the ambient wet bulb is 67 or lower, pretty much independent of what the dry bulb is. So it could be 100 degrees it doesn't really matter. We can still uh, get a, uh, that kind of approach. As long as you've got the uh, wet bulb, which suggests your humidity is at a certain point where you're able to use evaporation to your advantage. Exactly, yeah. So you've got a, a film of, of water that's flowing over the tubes to, to uh, really give you a, a, good, a nice boost in your heat rejection potential. Now, just a quick question, Keith. We're using water here. Um, I see that you're condensing it so it's going into a sump and being recirculated. Uh, are they large consumers of water, these units in, in general? Do you lose much? Uh, well, it's all relative. Uh, compared to a water-cooled chiller, mm -hmm. it's about 30% less water consumption mm -hmm. because we're only rejecting the load. We're not rejecting the heat of re uh, compression of the refrigeration cycle. Right, uh, and then as uh, the uh, ambient temperature begins to get cooler, um, we we use less and less water until finally, uh, at about fifty degrees, we can operate dry. Yeah, and we have other methods of uh, reducing water consumption that are beyond the scope of this discussion here. So, so it's really three things going on in one. You've got a, a air to air you've got evaporative water, and you've got uh, DX for when you need it. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's two airflow directions you'll see in the model here. One is uh, the hot air coming up out of the data center and through this, uh, this unit, and then the other is the air uh, coming through the unit itself. This is what they look like on a rooftop. Um, no surprise here. You've got these chimneys coming out of the top uh, to, to jettison the air out. Air generally comes in the side of one configuration or another, correct, Keith? Right. So we're bringing the air in up through the bottom into blow-through plenum fans, into a filter, and then the next element is your heat exchanger mm -hmm. and uh, trim DX cooling coil. Yeah. So this is the path uh, through the data center, and uh, this is the path uh, on the outside of the building. Exactly, and so above the sprays, we have a drift eliminator to make sure that no uh, water droplets uh, are escape from the system. And there's all, often a, a damper that is in that upper plenum that uh, will modulate during very cold conditions that you get in the northern climates. Uh, an interesting sidebar, when it's really cold outside, we can cool with just natural convection in some instances. So the fans, the scavenger fans go to zero, and just a chimney of uh, natural convective uh, heat rejection is taking place, and we actually have to modulate that damper to prevent overcooling. Here's a cross-section what it looks like. Um, I'll just uh, place these out. There's your delta T going in and out of the uh, data center, right? You've got a 20 degree spread there. Yeah. Right. If you go one more, you'll see the ambient condition. So here's a here's an example showing a hot uh, day of 100 degrees with a 70 wet bulb, and we're um, we're almost getting to set point with uh, with just that 70 wet bulb condition. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see here is when you're using using a wetted type air to air heat exchanger. Um, the scavenger exhaust leaving is cool. So we've got air that came in at 100, 
and 70 wet bulb, and it's leaving at 77 degrees, almost saturated, about 90% relative humidity. Mm -hmm. And so that gives us a secondary benefit in that we have a pseudo evaporatively cooled condenser. Yep. So it's a it's an advantage of a wetted type heat exchange system. So you've got you also see your three modes, uh, your winter dry mode, your summer just indirect mode, and then at the extreme wet bulbs we kick in the trim DX. Yep. Latent heat of vaporization works in all directions, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. And so, so the this is the unit we'll be talking about today, the Oasis. Um, comes in different sizes, but this is one of an example of it, right? 150 kW unit. Correct. So this is just an example to show you, um, you know, where we are today in data centers, at least uh, data centers with hot oil containment, is delivering air 70 to 75, and, uh, and some are even letting it go to 80 and a few are even letting it go warmer than that. But so here's an example that uh, if it was designed today with a 20 degree operating delta T, um, uh, we've got a coefficient of performance of 4.7. Mm -hmm. uh, we need about 20 tons, 19.25 tons uh, at an ambient of 95 and 80 wet bulb. And so you can see the various state points as the air flows through uh, the system, and then if you'll advance uh, uh, forward here, mm -hmm. you'll see what's going to happen in, uh, potentially in the future. So, as as uh, they allow, uh, as we are able to get warmer return temperatures through better containment and and so forth, and 115 is achievable even today. So this same system if operated with 115 return, uh, we're still able to supply the air at 80 degrees with the same amount of onboard DX. In fact, we need less. And uh, if you'll advance one more, you'll see um, the uh, we've got about 18 tons of DX required and the coefficient of performance uh, increases to almost eight. So I like to say this gives us the potential uh, to expand our capabilities in the future with this unit that was, you know, purchased today. So it gives you current and future uh, capacity uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where we where we see this as a real benefit right now is in um, recovery time. So when the utility power uh, is lost, you know, there's a little bit of time before um, the system kicks back on before the generators provide power. Mm -hmm. So usually our fans are still spinning and uh, and they're winding down, but the tubes are still wet. And uh, so they're still pulling heat out of the system the whole way. But as soon as the fans come back online, the pump's immediately online. And we're able to, the beauty of an indirect cooler is, you can see at 117 degree inlet, we're able to strip a lot of heat out, uh, even though the return temperature increased by 20 degrees, the, the temperature leaving the heat exchanger only increased by 4.7 degrees. Right, right. So it's a, it, we get a really nice rapid recovery. And it's typical, I would assume, to put this unit on its own UPS or generator or have some backup system for it so that in a power outage, in a high density situation, this would uh, be covered, right? Right. There's, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of what you, what the clients want to to, uh, to do there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's how it looks in the data center. Pretty straightforward. Uh, air coming up and back down. It looks like from a data center, from a white space point of view, it's an air handler. It is a big air handler. They sit up on the roof like this. This is one of the units you gave me or shot you gave me in, uh, in Jersey. Um, that's what they look like on top of the building. And so we've built here in CoolSim a representation of, of one of those. It's a fairly uh, modest size, 5,000 square foot, because I wasn't really trying to, to, uh, to do a huge model here. I was just trying to, to represent the situation. And we have two cooling units, uh, one of which could handle the load for the most part, delivering upwards of 50,000 uh, CFM each. 
So here's what that model looks like. Now I'm going to pop over and show you this model on a, on a different display here so that you can, uh, in fact, see what this looks like. So um, the way that works is you have the, uh, the units up on the top and you're able to, uh, um, let me just see here how to switch the monitor. And you're able to, let's see, just bear with me a minute here. There we go. So now you should be able to see uh, the second screen. And here is my CoolSim model. So the way CoolSim works, Keith, I'm assuming you can see this rotating around. You're the only one with a live mic at the moment. So tell me if you cannot see that. But this is CoolSim. I see it. Okay. I see it. And one of the things CoolSim allows you to do in its recent versions is ducting. And generally, these units are ducted. Um, so you have a big duct coming in and supplying one hand and down and dumping through. Uh, now what CoolSim will allow you to do is put the ducts right through the ceiling. You can see the ceiling there in green. There's a line right there that shows the ceiling. And you're able to create these ducts quite easily and effectively. This is just an air handler. This is just a unit. It just, uh, you know, it's a, a cooling unit. It, it has its own set of properties that you can set. You can build these yourself and set them up any way you want. Uh, the thermal load and these things, these are both set right now for 2,500 with a constant supply temp. Because what you're trying to do in CoolSim are look at the design edges. Where do I have to, you know, where do I have to worry? At what point do, am I going to run into problems? I find the easiest way to do this is to just directly set the airflow rates and the temperature rates to test the corners of the design. Where am I going to have issues? And inevitably, it's going to be the combination of these two items. Either you don't have enough flow rate to handle the situation at a given uh, temperature, uh, or your temperatures are too high, um, and your, your flow rate may be high, but your temperatures are also too high. So it's the combination of these two. In terms of there are other cooling methods here. By the way, the cooling capacity on this unit was also set to be 300 kW, which the unit can handle. Uh, and then you just size it to whatever you want. Now, we also have these in library form, but you can also just make them. To hook them up is quite easy. We have this ducting tool. It's a duct designer, um, and it allows you to connect things. So right now it's connected uh, on the front side of that. But you can unconnect them and then reconnect them. Um, so here's a connection point here. It's a slider. This is a duct. We mesh inside the duct, and we can connect automatically and um, and put this in place. Even the subducts can be separate or they can be created. You can add subducts by just pointing and clicking and adding a duct. And if I were to then use my smart length tool, it would project that to the next one and now I've connected those units together. So the ducting tool is quite nice and it does allow you to go right through walls and floors one of the things you'll notice here is in my containment. I've done containment here that I'm going to show you. And I've punched a hole through this baffle with that duct. So the duct will go right through, no problem at all. You can just extend it. You do not have to cut any uh, ducts. You can just, or any holes in anything, you can just set these things to whatever length you want and just let them go right down through. So it uh, holds together pretty well. So I'm just going to switch back over now to my other screen. I'm going to get used to this during this webinar, how to switch screens back and forth. And uh, so here we back, we're back to screen one now. So what I've done here is a pre-simulation report, which comes straight out of CoolSim, allows you to take a look at uh, what's been done, uh, what's been set up. You see here that I'm going to be supplying 50,000 CFM. Total to band by racks is uh, 49,000. This number right here, this ratio is important. You want to, in general, be able to deliver uh, as much uh, flow as the racks need. The racks are governed by the same equation I showed you earlier, which is the total heat is equal to the mass flow rate times density times specific heat times delta T. And, and they should be balanced. So the amount of air coming into the room uh, should be equivalent to what is demanded by the racks, and not more. If it's more, then what will happen is you'll get recirculation, and the air will somehow find its way back to the air handler, and you'll raise the return air temperatures, and that will make the entire system uh, less efficient. 
particularly if it's a economizer system, because remember it's the heat out, it's the rejection temperature that you want to keep as high as you possibly can. In terms of parameters, these are both running at 25,000 CFM because of course it is an N plus one design. And uh, what I'm able to do here in PowerPoint is take these CoolSim output images that I created based on that last simulation and look at them. And so this is, for those of you who are CoolSim modelers, of which there's a number in the audience today, the first thing I do is take a look at these plots, these pathline plots, to make sure the air is flowing the way I need it to flow. You see here it's coming out. These are supply air path lines. We're showing velocity here as a function of color and the air is coming out and entering the room uh, as it should. The next one I look at is um, returns to make sure the returns are working okay. And you see the return temps uh, uh, and return path lines coming up out of those uh, units here. So the heat is being captured by those chimneys and pulled up out and into, the, into this header, which is typical, and then sucked up into the uh, units themselves. So the first thing I check is to make sure the air is flowing the way I expected it to. And then the very next thing I look at are our rack inlets. Now we have a few of these plots that come in CoolSim. They're automatically generated. Uh, this is the one I go to first. It is a conformance plot that we put in it. And what you see over on the left, and by the way, this is being done in English units. So these are uh, degrees of Fahrenheit. You don't have to run the thing that way. You can run it any way you want. But I happen to build these in English units. Um, and you see here that we're having some trouble in the center of this room with, with air, with temperature. Temperature on these inlets is falling a little bit above the 80.6. The reason that number is important is for a couple of reasons. The first is that it's outside the specification that is recommended. Now, there is an allowable specification that is higher. The problem, however, you run into is that above 77 degrees, these server fans start to kick up uh, pretty high, and that will consume quite a bit of energy itself. So there's two reasons you want to be below 80. Uh, one is most of your customers and, and users will want you to be below 80. Uh, but the other is that um, you start to hit a point of diminishing returns where uh, the uh, fans in these units start to kick up pretty high. So we've got air distribution issues, and it's, it wasn't immediately evident that you'd have them because the first thing you think of in a design like this is, well, you know, I'm flooding the room with uh, cool air. I've got uh, the hot aisle contained. Uh, why do I need to worry? Well, air is a funny thing, and... Uh, it, it can go wherever it wants, and sometimes it doesn't go where you want it to go. And in particular, and by the way, this is a full range. You see here I'm now looking at the same rack inlets using a full range. So I've got 75 degree air entering, but it's getting upwards of 84 degrees at the top of these racks. And the reason why is because um, the containment is not perfect. Uh, and in this representation, I'm assuming a 5% leakage. The containment that I used is a, is, is a baffle. The baffle can be set to allow leakage to occur, and I generally set them for about 5% leakage because no containment is perfect. You can also get into the rack itself and put gaps in the rack or put servers or get more detailed about the racks if you choose. I didn't do that in this uh, demonstration simply because uh, we didn't know what they're going to be, which is often the case in a new design. You don't know exactly what's going on in those racks, yet because it hasn't been built. So you don't know what the servers are and the best you can hope for is, well, it's about 5kW or, or what have you. You set them for average watts per rack. That's an approximation. It's as good as you can do up front, of course, because you don't have any data about what the actual situation is going to really be. And then you use baffles at the top and I recommend letting them leak a little because this is more indicative of the real world anyway. This is a plot here of velocity. We're now looking at velocity here. Let me spin this around and put it into top view and show you uh, what's going on. You see I've got some problems with air in the center. It's not coming into the center of these racks, which makes sense. It's being dumped out of, this is a top view, so we're dumping out of these four ports into the room, and uh, we're trying to get it into the center. So even air distribution in a room 
is a, is always a challenge, to be honest. And in particular, when you're using ducted supplies like this, it gets a little more challenging. So something to watch out for. Now, you could say, well, all right, we did a hot aisle design. What if we did a cold aisle design? Now, this is fairly easy to do because you just change the direction of the airflow in the, in the cooling units themselves. So in this design, uh, all I did was switch the crack airflow direction uh, the other way around. So now we're cold air uh, coming out of these units and down and dumping into the center. And I flip the airflow direction of the racks. So now they're dumping hot air out. Same exact design, uh, just a change in the airflow direction, um, which is another way I've seen them done. I've seen them done cold aisle contained or hot aisle. Now, in a cold aisle design, you've got a little more control over the temperature of those rack inlets. And uh, what you'll find is that, oh, by the way, I always check the hot. This is just a reminder to check and make sure the hot is working. And yes, it is. You can see the hot coming out and going back up into the, into the returns. So the model is working correctly. Uh, and the racks are happy. You know, that's a fairly good representation of rack behavior. Uh, I don't generally worry about the little tiny bit of red you see right on the edges. That's uh, simply round off and, and a little bit of leakage, but you don't have servers up there anyway. In general, this model is behaving itself quite well in terms of rack inlet temps. Um, but the problem you do run into, of course, is this one, which is the room gets awfully hot. This is a cut plane at uh, six feet. And uh, what we're seeing here is that the temperatures in that room are getting very warm, upwards 90 degrees, 96, 97 degrees. And the problem there, what you run into, is what I call the human problem. And the design looks good, uh, and it works well, we can see. But as soon as a human enters the room, they start looking for thermostats to turn them down. The humans don't realize, unless they're the ones that have been involved with the design, that this is the hot aisle. You're standing in the hot aisle in a design like this. And what will happen is it's too hot for people. They don't like it. They start turning things down. What they're effectively doing is turning down the hot return, which we already mentioned is the key parameter to keep as high as you can. It opens the window of uh, time the heat exchanger can be used, the number of days, particularly in an air side or a water side heat exchanger. And furthermore, makes uh, heat rejection much more efficient because heat rejection is correlated to the delta T between uh, the medium, whatever it is, in the outdoor atmosphere. So keeping that high is going to be important for everything. And of course, here we have uh, velocity. Again, uh, not too bad. We've got good, fairly good velocity in this case, uh, fairly uniform throughout the room. So we eliminated that problem. We've simply got a temperature problem. Now, the next case that I encourage people to look at when doing these designs is the N plus 1 case. What happens when a unit goes down? Um, this is probably where CoolSim is used the most, is failure studies, understanding what happens when a unit goes down. So you he see here I've shut one down, and the other one has to pick up the load. So we can do this in CoolSim. Uh, during a single run, you can set up uh, multiple variations up to four where you can switch on and off crack units and their variables such as flow rate so that you can study the effects of these in a single simulation session. And it all comes back in a, in a single report. So I've just grabbed a few of those images. And you see here, again, I check my hot and cold to make sure they're both working OK. And you can see that I'm, I'm pulling up into just one of these units, the one on the left, and scavenging the, uh, the air out of the room. And you can see that I'm doing fairly well on the N plus 1. That's OK. I'm able to do it all uh, in this particular configuration uh, using just one unit running at the, the, a larger capacity, which is kind of surprising considering it gave us trouble before. So the airflow pattern using one unit in this case is uh, better than it was using two, which wasn't something that you could have predicted. And the temperatures look fairly good. So this is a good case uh, to, to look at. Uh, do them both. I didn't do them both. And I have a PowerPoint crash. <laughs> uh, sometimes putting 3D stuff inside of uh, PowerPoint doesn't always work. So I'm going to restart that. In the meantime, I'll go over to the uh, to my other screen and show you uh, 
the Coulson model in the M plus one case. So uh, let me just restart PowerPoint. So this is the model again that you use. You can use it either way to change crack or to do the ver parametric variation. You simply use this uh, command here. It allows you to switch uh, variation on or off and you can set the flow rates however you want, set the supply air however you want, and it all comes back in a standard, uh, a standard report. So um, that's how it works. It works fairly well. Um, all the reports come back unified under this report tab. I'm not sure I have them here because that, this particular model hasn't been run. This was just a demonstration model. But uh, that is how it works. And you can switch these uh, flow direction of these units any way you want with the editor. Uh, some of them you rotate, some of them you just switch. And uh, I mentioned the baffles before. The baffles down here that I use for containment uh, are such that you can set the airflow direction however you like to set it. And uh, generally I run them at about 5% uh, just to uh, just to give you a feel for how much. Sometimes I set them as high as uh, as 10% uh, depending on the situation. All right, so I got uh, PowerPoint back alive and uh, we're gonna talk about the Kyoto-based design. This is another uh, method for doing a similar thing. And I have uh, Chris with me today, Chris Fulton, who's going to, uh, who's from Air Enterprises, going to help me uh, through this section a little bit. Um, this one is fairly straightforward, 16,000 square feet of white space, so 416 racks. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than the other one, 3.2 megabyte uh, megawatts, and we're using nine Kyoto units. Now, Chris, you can jump in here at any time. I'll, I'll sort of take them through this, and you can add commentary as you see fit. But uh, here we have the data center over on the left. Uh, generally contained, so here you see with chimneys on it, hot aisle contained. Cool air coming uh, through the system in this direction. There's a wheel here. This is a wheel sitting on its axis. It is horizontal to us, and it rotates at a fairly low speed. It is, uh, Chris, what material is it made of? I, I actually do not know. It, it's an epoxy coated aluminum. Okay. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a sensible wheel in this application. And what is its RPM generally? Uh, the peak RPM on the units by the, the selections that we use is uh, 6 RPM. Uh, okay. The average in, in most temperate climates is less than 3 RPM. Mm -hmm. And we specifically select for rotational speed. So what you have here is a slow rotating wheel. Uh, hot air comes in from the data center, passes through it, and then back out. Uh, meanwhile, outside, you have cool air coming in, passing up through the same wheel. So we have an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. There is a seal of some kind, I'm assuming, across here, Chris, so that air can't travel through here. Well, again, just, just for clarity, what we have is a conductive heat transfer process here. Mm -hmm. And the, the wheel is, is rotating, as, as you point out, uh, Paul, through uh, a slot in that wall in this particular design of, of the unit. Um, there are seals, both uh, brush and labyrinth seals, mm -hmm. to deal with different um, pressure conditions uh, across the operating range of the unit. And one of the reasons, there's, there's two types of, if you will, leakage associated with the, the wheel. Uh, one is, is uh, uh, leakage across the seals, which is minimized by uh, maintaining relatively similar pressure differential, uh, pressure across the zones to minimize differential, excuse me. The other is leakage associated with the uh, open volumetric area of the wheel. Um, at peak air volume, our leakage is uh, less than 0.7% of total air volume, and the air is filtered inside and outside. So. The, the leakage is, is minimal, and that's at peak air volume. So it's a decimal place less than that in, in a normal operating state. Mm -hmm. This is a rendition that uh, Chris provided for how one looks. This is a, uh, how a data center might look. Uh, you have, again, the, uh, the Kyoto wheel here. You see it uh, uh, laying on its side, as I did, in the, as I showed in the last diagram. The air, in this case, uh, coming down into the white space, so it goes in this direction, 
down through uh, this passage and into the room. So this is hot oil contained. You see across this part of the room um, separation of chimneys effectively on the back side of these racks. It's not individual chimneys. It's one big large uh, volume. The air is able to get hot, move up out of there, come through. These doors are open. These are fans on these doors and they pull the air through here, back down through the wheel. Here you see the DX unit that is also included when necessary, if necessary, and uh, back into the room. So again, using outside air temperature to cool this wheel to provide uh, cool air to the data center and reduce the cost of power. Now here's the CoolSim model. Uh, that's an that's a image of it. I'm also going to switch over uh, to my other monitor and show you um, the dynamic CoolSim model and how we built it. So now in this case, instead of using ducts, what we did is used baffles on baffles. This is a, a feature of CoolSim. You're, you can use a single um, baffle. So if I hide the one, you'll see here the others. These are individual baffles. They're sitting on top of the roof. And the way CoolSim works is whatever baffles put in last has priority over the earlier one. So the baffle that's uh, making, uh, representing the roof, um, I set to, uh, to not leak at all. So it becomes the ceiling, if you will, of the data center. And then I placed on top these other uh, baffles. So you'll see this one, if we look at the, at the uh, percent area open on this thing, it's set for no flow. Okay, so that implies that this is switched off, so nothing flows through it. Um, and then I put these other ones on top, set them for 80% open, and it effectively creates holes in that baffle. It's an inexpensive way to punch a hole through something. And these are baffles as well, just uh, full containment. The nice thing about CoolSim is you can slice right through the rack. You see, I don't have to worry too much about um, making that the right height. I can slice right through the, uh, the rack itself. And as long as I don't obstruct the inlet or outlet of that rack, it will work fine. So containment's fairly easy to create. The uh, Kyoto units themselves are really just uh, in-row units, cracks set here. I did eight of them. You don't have to do it that way. You could make a crack unit with eight inlets and outlets on it. But this method does give you individual control over these fans. Um, and you can set them however you want. So that is how I created this particular representation. You can do it any way you like. And then I group them. A nice feature of CoolSim is it allows you to group. So you can rubber band um, the, the assembly effectively that you've made if you like and group it and then use the clone button here to clone it to create the others. The clone feature is a popular feature. It allows you to take individual objects or groups of objects and replicate them with an offset. So if I were to take uh, just that individual object, you see here that I get the opportunity to replicate it across the rest of the data center uh, with an offset in either direction. This saves a lot of time, particularly when you've got pods. There are pods, of course, that are symmetrical representations of racks and, and, and so forth. So you could make this entire group an assembly or a group and then clone it to make the rest. And that saves quite a bit of time during the build process. So let me just switch back to my other monitor. I'm getting faster at this now. So, uh, <laughs> so now uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some results and hope that PowerPoint holds up. Again, the first thing that I uh, do is take a look at the flow to see how it's behaving in the room and make sure it's, it's uh, behaving the way I expected it to. These are path lines again, and you see they're coming through as I would expect. They're coming uh, through the unit, into the unit, uh, down through it, and back out through the bottom. There is a baffle placed in front here uh, of the uh, uh, design to help distribute the air more evenly across in a length direction. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then underneath, we can see the air coming through fairly uniformly down the, uh, the various uh, aisles. These would be the cold aisles. You can see the velocity declines as it gets closer to the other side of the wall. This is true in general of uh, all data centers or all rooms that have air coming in on one side. Generally, you have high velocity on one side with fairly low pressure, and then the pressure rises as the velocity drops off. 
Remember that total pressure uh, is the sum of dynamic pressure plus static pressure, and one trades off for the other. As the velocity declines, the pressure goes up. Um, uh, one of Bernoulli's representations. And you can see it here in this representation as well. If we flip this one around and uh, take a look at it, you can see that we've got some high velocity sections right here in the center. So the air is coming in here and coming around these corners and uh, the velocity is going up fairly high. Uh, this sometimes causes problems with the, the fans in these racks. Uh, the delta P across these gets high and you have to kind of uh, be careful of that when you're doing, doing design. Uh, but generally speaking, um, they do look like this. You have high velocity on one side, low velocity on the other. This one holds up pretty well, uh, given the current state. Again, this is uh, with all units running. So it's not a surprise with all units running, everything behaves well. Uh, where you start to run into some trouble, oh, by the way, this is a full temperature range, uh, same design. Full temperature range, uh, you see here that uh, we're 73 on the bottom and 77. So we're seeing a four degree rise. And you see as you move across the room, it, gets, it comes up a little higher. Cold air wants to lay towards the bottom, so the bottoms of the racks in these designs will be a little better than the top. Um, and then you have to take a look at the N plus 1 operation. Now, I only did one of them here in this uh, design. I did a center one. Um, at least that's the only one I'm showing here. Otherwise, a PowerPoint doesn't hold up well and you get too many designs going on at once. But you see that uh, we've got some issues here with this center one out. Uh, we've got some vortices being uh, uh, going on in here, and some distribution of this air is not as perfect as you'd like it to be. Now, generally, these are run on VFDs. They're variable speed fans, and so the flow rates of the other units do come up. And you can model that and cool some by just resetting those to go up. Um, but uh, you still can run into some flow conditions. Uh, and in this design, we're running into a condition where uh, some of those racks are having trouble. Um, at that flow condition and that supply temperature. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it, you can always drive the supply temp down and, and help alleviate this problem, but it drives your energy consumption up unless the outside air is cold enough so that you don't have to worry about that. On a cold winter day, just flood the room with cold air and you, can, you don't have to pay the price in compressor power or in uh, fan power. But under this condition, where the air is being supplied, I believe I set it at 70 degrees or 75 degrees, I think 75, we're having some trouble in the center here. And that's, from a design point of view, the cases you want to look at. You want to look at the corner cases where you might have trouble and try to mitigate it as much as you possibly can. Again, we're assuming here a uniform distribution of load across these racks, and that can be adjusted as well. I have seen these designs where they front load. They load up the front of these racks heavier than the back end, knowing that there'll be a gradient. And that is how they can deal with it. Um, uh, but this is also a very symmetrical case. And you don't always run this. This might be something you see in a brand new data center. But it's not unusual that these are going into existing data centers or data centers that have other, other stuff in the way. <laughs> most notably things like uh, PDUs and, and older equipment that hasn't been moved out yet can cause some interesting airflow dynamics in the room that you need to take a look at. So in this case, that was one that uh, popped out. And it does look OK from an allowable point of view. Uh, so if you look at it from an allowable, this is the same plot, but it's going to 90 degrees now on the inlets, and you're in conformance. Uh, so. Uh, Something to be aware of. It's always the failure mode scenarios that you want to study, I think. So with the Coulson model, it allows you to do this. It's very easy, of course, to just change your supplier temps, change your flow rates, and take a look at the various situations and try to optimize the design. Um, you do things like change the mass flow rate, trying to tr change the supplier temp, look at the air distribution in the room, check cold aisle versus hot aisle, see which is better and which is recommended from an operational point of view. So at this point, uh, it's about five minutes before the hour. I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, it's fairly clear here that, uh, that this is going on. We're seeing a lot more of this in the modeling environments. Why I chose this topic today is that I am seeing more of it. 
people are using new systems for reducing that uh, compression power or the power to cool. And air distribution will continue to be something that, uh, that folks need to keep an eye on. So here's a few questions coming in. I'll just, uh, if you guys can open up your mics, we'll, I'll pass them out. Uh, one of them goes back, uh, Keith, to the Munter's discussion about uh, power outage in a high-density environment. Um, fans are on the UPS. I think I actually already hit that point, but generally you back up that system, right? There's always a generator backup. You can put the fans on a UPS if desired. And that would keep the transition from uh, happening that you discussed, right? Yeah, normally the, you know, you get a break. It all depends on the time duration from a utility outage until the time that the generators are back online, the transfer switches flip over. It's usually, that usually happens in 10 seconds or thereabouts. So it has a very little impact. Fans are still spinning. You're still extracting heat during that 10-second interval. Mm -hmm. If if uh, somebody wants to completely avoid that, then you can put the uh, fans and pump on uh, UPS. Great, um, Chris. There's a question here about a data center that you might be familiar with in the old Chicago Sun Times building, QTS data center. Yep. Uh, uh, someone wanted you to just uh, speak about that briefly. I'm not familiar with that. Um, well, it's a uh, it's approximately a 40 megawatt uh, site. It's a brownfield. Um, we've deployed uh, our first uh, seven uh, units there for the the data floor and uh, a couple more units for the uh, the UPS rooms, and uh, uh, we're just about to. Uh, start on the uh, expansion for that. It's a uh, it's it's pressurized plenum distribution, single side um, uh, application, mm -hmm. and uh, the throw distances on that uh, floor, or the, the 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 distances on that floor, run to about 175 feet on one side of the building and 200 feet on the other side of the building. Mm -hmm. So it's that a, that's a raised floor design then. It is a raised floor design. Um, the uh, as a company, they're they're supporting both, but because they are um, because they are they're a REIT, they're a colo, and they're a cloud vendor, and so they have three types of clients. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's a very nice site. Uh, they've just uh, finished the uh, the raised floor. It shows really well, and um, it, uh, it's going to be a, a great site. Just out of curiosity, do you see a trend uh, raised versus non? We looked today at two designs that were non-raised. Um, do you see any trending? Well, I mean, certainly there's uh, there's been a trend over the last 12 months in the large players um, because we've seen a lot of of new designs, uh, new go forward, uh, uh, repeatable designs uh, being done by a bunch of the large REITs and colos. And uh, I'd have to say that probably 80% of those new designs that we're seeing are uh, a, a situation where they are containment based. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, California, you kind of pushed the, uh, the needle uh, on that one. But um, certainly there's a trend towards that. The, uh, the Raging Wire uh, uh, data center, a million square feet down in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, uh, we're based on design there, and that is a containment-based solution. Now, non-raised floor is what you mean, right? Non-raised floor contained. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the from my perspective, I mean, when I'm talking about it from an airflow point of view, um, when when I say uh, that, uh, they could very well have a, somebody could have a raised floor, it could be using for electrical distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, United Airlines in Chicago, for example, uh, is a, is a situation with ever raised floor, but we're not using the raised floor for distribution. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five thousand square feet. Um, it's a four megawatt uh, build out today on a six megawatt uh, design, and uh, we are serving oh 175 feet to 200 feet uh, from the units. Uh, the variation across the floor plates about a, a degree and a half, as reported by the client. Mm -hmm. So fairly uniform distribution uh, in a containment environment. Now, in the design that we looked at, um, we did use a diffuser. Is that uh, typical to use a diffuser plate? Um, um, I, I think you called it a screen or a diffuser that runs the length of the data center. Yeah, 
The, uh, with respect to that, for most people, that's actually a security matter. Um, and and it's, a, it's a division between, you know, a mechanical access way and, uh, and the units, uh, more so than, for example, providing uh, back pressure. It, originally, when we, uh, when we first did some of these designs, we theorized that uh, having a little bit of back pressure there in a lightly loaded state uh, would allow better uh, traverse path in the data center. Right. And we did find that, but um, in general, we, we see that these are basically security screens more so than diffusers per se. That yep. The intent is not diffusion, but security. Yep. Well, all right. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Keith and Chris uh, both for being here today. I think that comes to the end of our session. It's uh, try to keep these to one hour. If, uh, if any of you have questions or would like uh, more information, please let us know. Uh, our contact information is listed here on this last slide, both uh, uh, all of our contacts, mine and, and Keith's and Chris. If you'd like to uh, reach out, please go ahead. I have also recorded this uh, event today and we'll post it on our website in the archive directory. I want to thank you all for attending. If you would like a uh, professional development certificate associated with this session, please send me a note and I'll pass that along. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody and uh, say have a good day to everyone. Thanks, guys.